Hi there. Well, before I start my talk, I just wanted to know how many of you were familiar with the content of my talk. And so uh, I thought I would give you a little quiz. How many of you have seen this? Any of you? Okay, let's try this one. No? No? Okay. Well, you may have just come across a sort of random, rather rare video like this. I'm Keiko Bong, and um, today I wanted to talk to you about the world of K-pop, um, not only because K-pop has become such an interesting phenomenon, because, but because it really matters to the way that we are looking at engagement online between content makers and content users. I, I hope the echo is going to be OK. <laughs> Uh, on an ordinary day, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm a closet gamer. I, uh, knew, I'm a futurist, and I'm probably a media inter entrepreneur. Those would probably be my, my adjectives that I would choose. Um, I, uh, have, uh, I started out learning about K-pop because I was doing a documentary series about Korean popular culture. And the last one I started back in 2010, and it was supposed to be about Korean uh, cultural pop, pop music. And um, it's very interesting because, first of all, I want to tell you that the head of YouTube Trending told me that since 2010, and, and in fact, since the first time that they had started recording trending of K-pop on YouTube, there have been 60 billion clicks. Think about that, 60 billion clicks on YouTube, and that's growing. Those are still probably a year or two old stats. Um, I'm going to now show you uh, a little bit from the documentary about what is K-pop. Could we try? K-pop record and you listen to Big Bang's album, there are similarities, but then there's that tone and that vocal structure that makes it unique. And there's been a lot of factors as to why Korean acts are finding success abroad. Um, on the surface, it all looks really shiny, slick. Um, the production value of a lot of Korean music, everything from the audio to the visuals, is impressive. So in the same way, the craftsmanship and popularity and perfectionism that you might find in the industrial design of a Samsung phone or an LG TV or a Hyundai car. You now see perhaps maybe even the sound design or the visual design of a K-pop hip-hop song. Can you move it down? Yeah, move it. Great. Right. I was saying that the first time that I really became aware of it, other than just through the fact that my husband is Korean, and uh, I travel a lot to Korea, um, was because I was doing a documentary series for Discovery Asia. And um, when you're in the edit suite, you're usually on a timeline and you're editing and we're doing this story about K-pop stars and the music videos, everything that goes on. And um, this is us in the edit suite and we had this slate there called fandom. We never really paid attention to the fandom. We were just like, oh, we're editing this, we're editing that. And I said, you know, it's really bothering me. There's a slate on the timeline that says fandom, what is this? Let me just go tonight, I'm gonna hunt something out on YouTube and I'll be back tomorrow with a couple of videos and then we'll just move on with the story. Well, I did not go back to the edit suite for one month. I actually spent the entire month, 15 hours a day, um, in self-imposed isolation, <laughs> Uh, looking at over 4,000 clips on YouTube, Tumblr, uh, Twitter. I just looked at the entire social media universe and it was absolutely overwhelming. And I fell in love with the fandom of K-pop. And uh, I have to tell you that this was such a painful exercise that I had to go into the guest bedroom so I wouldn't keep my husband up. And uh, I actually, this was my only view to the world. 
I actually posted it on Instagram <laughs> at the time because I said, this is all I'm seeing other than YouTube videos every day. So that was sort of um, my introduction to that. Um, and um, I wanted to say that one of the things, one of the most, oops, how do we do this? Yikes. Back, back, back. Oh, okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. I want to say one of the most interesting things is the amazing amount of creativity that's online with the fandom. And I'm sure you all have seen various types of this. So I'm going to show you two different clips. The first clip will be about, um, about a, a genre called the music reaction video. Now, a music reaction video is when people actually, and they, they curate and they take a, a favorite K-pop music video, they put it at the bottom of the screen, and they react to it. And it's amazing. You'll get elderly people reacting to it, parents reacting to it, families reacting to it, children reacting to it. Um, we have black people reacting to it, Hispanics reacting to K-pop. I think it's all over there. But um, it's, it's just amazing the amount of um, charisma, the amount of humor, and the amount of inventiveness. The amount of inventiveness that you see. And so the first thing I'll show you is just a, a little bit of the music reaction videos. And you'll find that sometimes it's very analytical, very reflective, sometimes absolutely just hysterical and fun. Um, and then the second clip I'll show you shortly after that is just going to be different genres, the subgenres that were really surprising to me. Uh, I still really don't understand why people enjoy watching people uh, pull open a box of DVDs that they've just gotten from Korea. But um, I love that there's a genre like that. <laughs> so let me just show you. We've seen a lot of the videos. There's a lot of breaking of things. They show GD holding the white mask in front of his face. When he moves away from his face, his face is painted completely black. So that represents his sadness, darkness, loneliness, depression. Then you see him break it. So that is him breaking away from the GD persona. <laughs> 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 so this is not the first time, by the way, K-pop fandom is not the first time that we've actually seen fandom. It's but what I found interesting was the most, the first documented inst instance of fandom was with Sherlock Holmes. In the late 1800s, uh, he, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle decided to kill off Sherlock Holmes. And there were uh, hundreds and uh, possibly thousands of people showed up at the publisher's office and convinced Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to revive Sherlock, uh, which is why we still have him today. And we should thank them for Benjamin Cumberbatch, maybe, perhaps. Um, and, uh, and as this, uh, we have a very famous professor, um, Henry Jenkins, who, who wrote a book on contextual po poachers. We've always also have fandom in the past century with Star Wars and Star Trek and uh, Lord of the Rings and, and the thousands of people who go to Comic-Con. There's also something called KCON run by CJ ENM, uh, which is humongous. Last, this year there were 80,000 people in Los Angeles. They hold it for K-popers on both coasts of the United States, in France, and in Dubai. So we're seeing this incredible communities coming together around subject matter that they really like. This week's special word is egyo. When someone has egyo, it means they act cute with a childlike charm. Make your voice higher than normal, just enough to make it sound cute. Use your hands and eyes whenever possible. Remember to wink, blink, and curl your hands around your cheeks. All right, so I won't be egg-yo, uh, but uh, I just want to say that um, what really stands out amidst this noise on the level of the K-pop devotion that's so different than other celebrities. After all, we have beehivers for Beyonce, and we have um, we have the believers for Justin Bieber. It's actually this incredible intimate relationship that's built up with K-pop stars. Um, they are an organization. The fandom are very organized. They they exchange, they share, they fight a lot about who their favorite group is, and that is very much in part due to Korea's early adopter culture and also this culture of the Korean idol, 
where engagement on an intimate level is very, very important to being a fan. Um, Korean music management companies, in fact, um, have a long nurtured a unique style of what idol culture is, and that includes releasing almost weekly images of pimply, sweaty young teenagers getting ready for the concert, um, and uh, you know, uh, high five thons variety shows, photos, shops. I mean, literally, there's observational um, films that uh, follow them 24/7, and so it's a real job for these stars. Um, and this is where uh, the fans are really different. It's more than the glamour and the bling. It's, a, it's the engagement. Um, and I think that this intimate engagement has allowed people to see on, uh, things that they say have changed their life. So I'd really like to show you some of the reaction of, of fans as to why they actually feel that this has changed their lives. And how it's kind of like coursing through me. And whenever I open my mouth, it just like comes out. Kind of just you know, sitting there going, oh, I want to wear stuff like that. And I want to, you know, um, be as cool as that or be as, you know, confident as that. And, you know, dye my hair pink. I think it's actually helped me be a lot more open-minded about other cultures and their music. But now I'm cheerful and I'm always smiling. When I talk about them, it's just like non-stop and I feel like I can live. It's freeing and it's healing and it's therapy. Like you can just, you know, have a good time and it takes your mind off of all the craziness. It took my mind off the disease. My parents are just like, why do you listen to it? What is it? What is so special about it? K-pop has really changed what I want to do with my future. I, w I really want to learn Korean. I've really <laughs> made an effort in my everyday life walking around, trying to be more positive. But it's inspiring to know what they do and encouraging to see how hard they work. So, you know, when they come out with their music, it's like, oh, I have to listen to this because, man, they stayed up till like 10 in the morning just recording this song. Thank you, Emnet, for providing us an opportunity to show our love for K-pop. Thank you, and come Shanita. And that's why I talk about it so much, because it really changed who I am. It, like, changed my inside. Like, I was so close to giving up, and then, that so those are some really sincere, poignant voices that really moved me. Um, but um, I was talking about the stats, uh, 150 to 200 million fans, and the geographical spread is stunning. In 2012, a boy band called Big Bang went and um, put on their Facebook, where would you like us to hold your next concert? And um, it was really extraordinary. What we found out is that even if you don't have 3G, you can write a few words on Facebook and you can vote. The number one country, Peru, of all places. And I can't tell you how angry the Brazilians were for having to go to Lima for the concert. But it was extraordinary. Um, in 2002 also, this is before Gangnam Style, the number one band for MTV was, was uh, 21 and it was voted in as a, the best new band of the world. And, and MTV tells me 96 countries voted, and they said it was 24 hours all night long, and it was all the way to the end. They broke the servers in the beginning within 48 hours. Um, but the most amazing uh, thing was that the voters weren't even from, from Korea. I don't even think the Koreans knew this band was up. It was from the United States and from the Philippines. And so we're seeing that all of this power has enabled Korean acts to enter billboard charts at such high rankings that's even uh, convinced Apple and Spotify to include them as a proper genre in um, their various stores. And the influence, actually, there they are, 21, it goes further. We have, in a longitudinal study of K-pop fans, we've seen that 30% of K-pop fans actually go out to learn Korean, which is really astonishing. 40% watch dramas and go to Korean restaurants, and 50% visit Korean. Korea. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, the embassies are overloaded. So last year, the Korean government started 20 new cultural centers. And they have an algorithm. For every 2% they invest in K-pop, 3% returns in tourism. <laughs> so, um, and people often ask me why. Why, why K-pop? Why do people love it? And especially older Koreans are really skeptical. They think the government's sort of lying about the figures. The simplest answer for me is that a lot of youth were raised with anime and manga and, and uh, PlayStation games. And these are the avatars come to life with phenomenal music and talent. Um, but I think the uh, best answer would be that as you've seen with the reaction videos, there's a positivity and a joy associated with the hip hop and the R&B that comes out with K-pop. 
You know, t in, in the United States, hip hop traditionally uses lyrics that are heavily laced with drugs and sex and guns and violence. Um, but K-pop music really uses um, very uh, positive, joyful lyrics. And so it, it actually goes on not just to the fans, but to their parents. We have mothers who love our K-pop fans. And, um, and also these stars are, have to be, be because of Korean neo-Confucian values, it's almost, almost paragons of your virtue. So we don't have rehab, and we don't get ugly divorces and scandals, although I think that's probably going to change as, <laughs> as Korea continues to modernize. But all of this excitement and passion and creativity doesn't stop at this amazing story about K-pop. K-pop only really matters in the bigger scheme of things because this uber-organized massive audience and fandom is showing us quite simply how content and the world of content is changing online. We are now seeing a curation of the internet. Um, YouTube is breaking down into multi-channel networks and aggregation of the YouTube channels. We're doing one ourselves with um, overseas K-pop fans and we're seeing the buzzword um, com communities develop around people who share an, an, uh, an intense passion. Well, it's not likely that there'll be another fandom of an entire country anytime soon. Um, we're likely to see going forward this extreme passion apply to other subjects in what I call power, com power communities. I hope, hopefully it comes up. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> it, um, these are already emerging, and they're, they're grouping around th hobbies and things that you love. Um, cooking, fishing, knitting, Scrabble, um, uh, distilling wine. And these dev devotees will um, react in similar little ways, and they are going to spend more time around the things they love and share and engage and fight about esoteric um, topics online. Um, and coincidentally, they're going to spend a lot of money on their hobbies freely. Uh, the Korean government thanks you very much. Uh, they've just sur surpassed $1 billion in the export of Korean beauty products, which I'm sure you're aware of here in Hong Kong. You're in the number one market, thank you. Um, and a billion or more on sales of everything from kimchi to language schools to adventure wear. But most of all, users are not just becoming creators, they're now an integral part of the ecosystem that cannot be denied nor ignored. Once upon a time, the world's content was decided by gatekeepers, people in a boardroom somewhere, uh, executives in a boardroom. Today, K-pop has taught us that all of us should be the gate crashers, and future content will become an ongoing debate and engagement on both sides. And if I can leave you lastly with this thought, if a small Asian country of 50 million or so can get people from more than 200 countries from around the world to learn an arguably esoteric Ural Altaic language, <laughs> to love their music, their fashion, their food, their cultures and traditions, then think of the possibilities that are out there for all of the other communities and fandoms uh, to grow, create, and be empowered as well. So it's a great, exciting start for a new economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. You made it. Thank you so much.